Okay. You're welcome. Okay, so are you a planner or are you a spontaneous person? Okay. Um, how many of you keep a, a calendar with all the things written on it that you have to do? Okay, so do I. Um, I'm a planner. I can't stand not looking at my calendar uh, to see what's coming up. And um, my life gets complicated, so I uh, have to kind of keep it for me anyway, straight up. Uh, it's so, I, I'm kind of a paper and pencil kind of calendar person, but um, there's many of you with smartphones and um, so on have access to calendars that make it easy for you to use those as well. So I, um, when it comes to schoolwork, at least, I highly suggest you keep up with a uh, calendar like that. Um, we ask you a question. Maybe this will help you identify whether you are a player or a spontaneous person. Let's say that you go home after class tonight and a friend calls you up and says, let's go to the movies. Okay. Are you the kind of person that just um, grabs your keys, goes out the door, and, and lets them pick you up? Or are you the kind of person that would first Get on the internet, take a look and see what's showing at the movie, see what time they're showing, and uh, make a decision about where you're going to go. Your planner? Okay. Second. Your planner too? Okay. This is all business people, that's awesome. But, there's plenty of spontaneous people in the business world too, and there's room for both. We're just going to try to take this and put it into perspective of uh, planning for organizational or organization's goal. Think about this one um, at Christmas time. You make a list of all the people you want to buy presents for. Do you estimate how much you want to spend on each one of them, or start? combing the web looking for the exact right present for them or do you wait at Christmas Eve and run out to Walmart and buy presents? Okay? Again, yeah, a difference between a planner and a spontaneous person. And there's no right or wrong. I'm not trying to say you're right or wrong by being one or the other. However, we will take a look at some of the advantages of being a planner when it comes to um, organizational play, your personal life, that's up to you. I found in my personal life, usually one person in the family tends to be the planner and the other defaults and accepts whatever plans they come up with. Like, who plans the family vacation? Who decides where you're going? Uh, and who gets on the phone and makes the reservations or gets on the internet? makes the reservations and buys the tickets and all that sort of stuff. If you've taken over that role, you're probably the planner in the family. So, of course, some things require much more planning than other things do. But if you're ever planning it, that takes a lot of planning, right? Although there are some people that jump up and run to Vegas and get married on the spur of the ball. So there's some possibilities for spontaneity there as well. So let's take a look at um, how this actually uh, works out when it comes to managerial characteristics and uh, how it can affect your organization to whether you're a planner or a spontaneous person. So let's see if I can get things rolling here and share our video. to take a road trip, 
you'd use a map to plan how to get to your destination. It would be difficult to reach your destination if you didn't know the route. Yet numerous people in business don't plan and are wondering why they're not seeing better progress. Perhaps Winston Churchill said it best in World War II when he said, he who fails to plan is planning to fail. The most basic function of management is planning. Planning develops a firm's direction. Employees want to know the road ahead. Managers need to share where they are going so that employees can help the organization get there. With planning, managers don't have to react to change. They embrace it. In this lesson, I'll introduce you to the management function of planning. Welcome to Principles of Management, Lesson 3, Planning. This is Jimmy Allen. For Lesson 2, read Chapter 4. The importance of planning, the framework for plans, types and uses of plans, and strategic planning process will be explored. Planning is the primary management function because the other management functions derive from it. The plan tells us where we are going and answers the question, who, what, when, where, and how. But first, managers must determine the purpose of the organization, its mission. Top managers invest a great deal of time and thought creating a mission statement. They answer the question, what business do we want to be in? Next, planners can anticipate opportunities and threats and assess the likely influences of political, economic, social, and technological trends. After analyzing the anticipated future environment within the organization and outside of it, goals can be developed. Goals such as profit and customer satisfaction are general and long-term. But you cannot do a goal, so managers use a proven planning technique known as Management by Objectives, MBO. Objectives are set so that employees can realize their accomplishments. This is done by writing SMART objectives. S is for specific. An objective must be specific in scope and duration with a single key result. M is for measurable. If possible, state the objective as a quantity. A is for attainable. It must be realistic within the resources that are available. R is for results. The successful completion of the objective should make a difference and be results oriented. K is from time limited. The objective should be traceable with realistic time. Many objectives are realistic, yet the time it takes to achieve them may be unrealistic. For example, it is realistic to want to lose 10 pounds. However, it is unrealistic to want to lose 10 pounds in one week. How many pounds do you want to lose? By when and why? To test for validity of SMART objectives, ask yourself the following questions. S, exactly what is my objective? M, what would a good job look like? A, is my objective feasible? R, is my objective meaningful? And T, is my objective traceable? Strategic planning is a formal planning process. Strategic plans are long-term, lasting more than one year. First, the mission and goals are created. Objectives are set. The environment is evaluated. Then, alternatives are identified and evaluated. Next, the best solution is selected and the plan is implemented. Finally, the results are evaluated and controlled. The SWOT analysis provides the basic analytical framework for strategy research in four areas, strengths, 
weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The SWOT data is used to analyze all subsequent steps after the mission and goals. The other steps will not be any use at all unless the SWOT analysis is executed in a precise and exhaustive manner. The internal environment is analyzed by looking at the company's strengths and weaknesses. What business should the company compete in? The external environment is analyzed by looking at the company's opportunities and threats. Which competitive advantages does the business have or need? The SWOT analysis depicts the situation for which a decision is required. You saw as we studied planning that it is the most fundamental function of management. It is the way that managers determine what is to be done and shows us the road ahead. Managers ensure the probability of success by beginning the strategic planning process with a clear mission and using quality information acquired from the SWOT analysis. Managers continuously rethink prior assumptions in light of new observations. Strategy is adapted to enable the organization to stay ahead of the competition. With this lesson, we've shown you the management function of planning. Try to relate what you read and discuss to your own real experiences at work, in the classroom, on the athletic field, and at home. Coming up in lesson four, we'll start studying quality management. This has been Management, Lesson 3, Planning. I'm Jimmy Allen, and I look forward to guiding you each step of the way as you determine your own <coughs> philosophy of management. <laughs>
that uh, that means that you've got to know what your objectives are first off. Okay, what is your company trying to do? What product is it selling? Uh, who are customers? Uh, what are they trying to achieve? So the firm is going to first of all have to identify where it wants to go and then how it will get there. I don't know if you guys have ever just taken road trips with your family or friends. Um, my daughter is famous to call me up and say, let's go to dinner. She'll drive to the house, and I'll get in the car, and I'll say, well, where are we going? I don't know. Okay. Um, there's a failure right there. So where we were going, so we couldn't very well play. I couldn't decide whether we needed to turn right or left coming out of the driveway. Okay, so uh, we need to know where you are going first. All right, now of course, planning does have purposes. Uh, you reduce your uncertainty. Um, I'm driving out of my driveway. Uh, I didn't know where I was going, I might have turned the wrong way and actually end up putting a lot of miles on my car I didn't need to put on my car. Okay, so you're minimizing your risk by reducing your uncertainty. Uh, it will <coughs> your organizational success. It helps with the coordination of effort among all the members in your organization. And it helps also uh, the accomplishment of overall organizational objectives. Very, very um, good reasons to do some planning. Planning also forces managers to become future oriented. Think about what the future is going to bring. It also forces some coordination among those that are making decisions. The focus tends to be directly on what the company's objectives are. Uh, and by doing that, the firm becomes sustainable. It also helps them prepare uh, to deal with problems that may be incur incurred along the way as the firm is doing its business. Now, of course, there are some downsides. Hey, if you're one of the people that said, I was, I would just jump in the car and go with my friend to the movie without looking at to see what was going to be on the, um, at the theater. Um, you probably kind of said, well, why did you do that? Um, I would have said, well, it took time to do that. I didn't want to take time to do it. So planning does take time. In an organization, it does uh, mean that your managers must get involved and you hold some of their time to actually look towards the future. Planning sometimes makes uh, people a little rigid. They want to do exactly what they planned and nothing else. They are uh, not able to adapt. Okay, so you get in the car and you'll decide to go to the movie. This time you plan to go to see a particular movie. When you get there, you find that all the seats are sold out. Okay. Some people might get upset and say, let's go home and forget about it. But if you are adaptable, you might decide to go see a different movie or maybe drive to a different theater that has the same movie playing. So it just depends again a lot on the, uh, how rigid people are. And don't forget with um, managerial functions, there's three other functions organizing and controlling. So if you are busy doing the planning function, you may have less time to focus on the other three functions. So some people get so carried away in the planning, they forget about the other things that are going on. So um, those are downsides. It's not perfect to be a planner. But again, as I said in the, in the video, planning is the primary management function and it is the basis for all the other functions. See the little uh, 
down here, it's almost like a building. It's hard to see on the screen, but the planning is the foundation <coughs> or the other. Okay, two basic types of plans. You have standing plans. Um, that's when a company is planning for whatever activity that it's done repeatedly. Um, they are routine guidelines. And, and something that's going to occur over and over, um, so they have actions that will take place repeatedly. Like we have plans when the spirit comes and wants to apply for financial aid. There are certain steps that are followed uh, because that happens repeatedly in the education. Single use plans are for single purposes only. Uh, per perhaps a particular program or a budget uh, needs to be developed and uh, the focus for the plan is just for that activity. Okay? So standing plans and single use plans. As a manager, you're probably going to get more involved in uh, the single use planning aspect because a lot of the standing plans have already been developed in our end place. All right, six steps in the planning process. Starting out with figuring out those objectives. Okay, what is it you're trying to do? Uh, and then step two is come up with alternative ways to reach those objectives. Okay, so I want to go to the movie so I can be entertained. That's my objective. What are the alternative ways? Well, I can go to the theater in Halifax. I can, um, maybe if all I want is entertainment, my choice would be to uh, go to a play in the browser. Okay, just depends on where your organizational focus is or your personal focus in this case. All different alternative ways. Step three, develop premises upon which the alternative is based. Okay, well, so maybe we say, um, if the movie is uh, sold out, then I'll choose the other alternative. I'll see if I can get tickets to the property. Okay? Premises, all right? Then choose the best alternative for getting to your objectives. Okay, for most of us, if it's us going to the movies, we probably get the car drive to the movie. That would be our best alternative. Okay, and how do we go about doing that? Well, we might have to pick up some folks along the way, we might have to run by the ATM machine. Um, maybe you have to check the columns of the uh, movie that's playing and so on. And step six is put the plan into action. And I lose for Sienna.
any of the other sites? out on our end so if you want you could ask her to maybe walk I think I can hear her fine. okay it's fine. All right. if you can't just if you come back and just let us know we can try to adjust it but it's maxed out on this side yeah it did one time it was like really really low like really hard to hear right but it's not I think it's on her Company. That's what you're trying to accomplish. 
Nike to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Notice they don't just say to produce shoes. Okay? Uh, they have uh, something behind that. Uh, Wendy's, our mission is to deliver superior quality products and services for our customers and communities through leadership, innovation, and partnerships. And you thought all they wanted to do was to cook ever. Okay? Much broad, much, much broad. Okay, so um, companies will consider their customers, their competitors, their suppliers, and the government when they are trying to uh, come up with their objectives, along with the environment that they operate in. Would you think the mission statement for South Side Virginia Community College would be the same as that for uh, University of Virginia? Probably not, okay? Their customers are not the same, okay? Uh, their competition is not the same. The environment is different as well. So consider all of those things. Uh, as far as uh, focus areas, of course, where the company is standing market-wise, how innovative are they, how productive are they, what kind of resources do they have, both physical resources like buildings and land and that kind of stuff, as well as financial resources, uh, profitability, uh, performance of their managers and the development needs there, uh, performance and attitudes of their workers, and what are their responsibilities towards the public. Alright, so short-term objectives, okay, that's things that you want to achieve in a year or less. Year or less. Intermediate term, one to five, Okay, long term, five to seven. Okay. Think about the weight loss examples today. Okay? Um, or to lose 10 pounds. Okay? That's probably a short term goal for most people. Okay? And or less. But it could be long term for someone else who is. Uh, significant changes in their life. Okay? Long-term goals related to that might be something like uh, to achieve a healthier body. Okay? And that's something you don't do in a year or less. That's something that takes a little more time. All right, so your objectives have to be high quality objectives. You don't want to um, <clears throat> just come up with stuff and garbage and throw it out and say, this is what we're trying to achieve. Um, you need to know who's responsible, who's going to have a voice in setting them. Be as specific as possible. Uh, relate your objectives to whatever actions are appropriate. And pinpoint what you are expecting. Um, on the video, she needs the acronym SMART, specific, measurable, and so on, um, as being a good way to set your objectives. Now, you do want to set your goals high enough. And employees have to strive to meet them, but not so high that they'll give up trying. Okay? I want to lose weight. My goal of 10 pounds might be achievable, but if I sat it at 50 pounds, I probably would get disgusted before I got there and give up. Same thing with organizational goals. Um, specify when. You want to achieve, you want to lose 10 pounds. Well, that doesn't say anything. 10 pounds by when? And maybe you want to lose 10 pounds by the time you go to the beach or something. 
set objectives in relation to other organizational objectives, okay? Put them all to tie together, okay? And clear and simple. Okay, I know you all have heard the KISS, simple statement. That's uh, something you kind of need to follow throughout a lot of things, especially when you are writing papers in my class. So, uh, I did not want for a lot of PS. Okay, specifically, this MBO management by objectives is very, very popular tool to use uh, that is uh, an approach exclusively on objectives. So you come up with objectives, they have to be mutually set and agreed upon. Then you conduct performance reviews periodically and you get, you reward those that actually achieve those goals. This is the process we use here at the school. We sit down with our deans as, as faculty and we set what we're trying to achieve for the upcoming year. But we agree upon them. We don't just, uh, you know, the dean doesn't come here and come to me and say, I want you to do so and so. We actually talk about them ahead of time. Okay. Then periodically we will get reviews to see if we're on track to achieve those goals. Not a year down the road, you ought to get feedback all along. Okay. And then if you do reach the goal, you get rewarded for it. it. Used to be we got merit raises, okay, for reaching our goals. Uh, lately we just uh, we're told that we are rewarded if we just take our jobs. And so um, there's a little bit of a different approach based on budgetary constraints. But ultimately there is some kind of reward. It doesn't have to be financially reward though. It certainly be uh, promotions, uh, it could be um, a certificate with your name on it, all kinds of different things. So again, it's sort of a circular process because you set the objectives, uh, they of course have to tie in with the organizational objectives, get monitored along the way, and then evaluate it, get rewards, and Start setting objectives for the next year. On and on again. In order for MBO to work, you must have commitment to top management. <coughs> okay? Um, and you must have your managers and your employees work together to set those goals. You don't want those goals to be dictated to your employees. Um, the evaluation against those objectives to take place. I've been in organizations where we spent a lot of time coming up with objectives and then, then nobody ever evaluated this to see if we actually achieved those objectives. Okay. And then management needs to follow through and reward accordingly. Okay. Very discouraging when you hit all of your objectives and nobody ever validates that or rewards you for it or even mention, hey, you're your job. And again, MPO is very popular. It has upsides and downsides. Uh, it does top things in with the organization. Uh, so the, your goals are uh, supporting what the organization is trying to achieve. But it is time consuming. Okay, every year I have to write down all my goals, I have to have discussions with my, my boss and you know, have paperwork and that kind of stuff to fill out. At the end of the year, I have to provide proof that I actually did achieve those goals. Now, as far as actual tools, there are lots of tools out there that can uh, help you in planning. Forecasting tools. Forecasting is the process of predicting the future. Okay, it's predicting your what's going on in your environment and what's going to actually influence your organization. Um, so it, it helps you formulate plans that are going to more closely mimic what's actually happening in your uh, environment. 
one of the types of forecasting are sales forecasts. Okay. Certainly, extremely important for business organizations to be able to forecast how much of their product they're going to sell or their service they're going to sell. Um, they're both qualitative and quantitative approaches that you can use. You can see some of those listed there. We're not really going to get into the different methods, but this is a simple graph. It's just a, a simple example of using regression analysis, which is a way to forecast for future sales. So you can see they actually plotted their plot points here for certain years and using regression analysis, which is a mathematical tool that you find in Excel and so on. They kind of put a trend line here. I'll look at that trend line in an IBM. The product statement method uh, looks at the life cycle of products. Um, products tend to, in the introductory phase, sell quickly, grow, course, and at some point they're going to mature and actually saturate the market so that they will turn around and start the decline. Um, in most all of these technology type things, uh, smartphones are in the growth stage. Okay, people are still buying those. They're, they're refining them because the smartphone can more and more and more. Okay, so we're seeing people buy more of those. Personal computers a little bit longer, farther along the way. Microwave ovens, though, are pretty well saturated. Most everybody that is going to buy a microwave oven probably has already gotten one. Okay. Sometimes uh, people just don't understand what the plans are. 
Are the managers are not engaged in the plan? Okay, just let me know if that happens. Uh, sometimes uh, the person who's responsible is not the correct. Sometimes they're just not hard enough to achieve, so that people don't even really try to achieve. Okay, think about if you ever had a goal. Oh, here, here we go. How many of you made uh, resolutions on New Year's? I resolved to so and so by the end of the year. If you didn't make one, you probably didn't make it because you said I'd never do. That's basically an example of a failure of a plan. Okay? Now, why did that plan fail? Did it too hard to achieve? Did you not have everybody buy in on it that needed to be? Maybe your resolution, here's one. I'm going to pay off all my credit cards. Okay? Well... That might just be too hard to achieve. Okay, maybe you need to say, I'm going to pay off my bell credit card. Okay? Or um, when you do that, maybe there are other people involved that didn't buy into it. You say you're going to pay off your bell credit card, but hubby's got rights to use that. He goes and buys himself a couple of nice suit there. Okay, they didn't buy in on it. Okay, or maybe it, didn't, it wasn't your responsibility after all. You're, you're not the one that's paying the bill. Okay, a lot of things can cause your plans fail. But the key about any kind of failure is to understand why it failed and eliminate those factors so your future plans will actually succeed. Okay. Budgeting is an example, it's the purest example of planning. Budgeting is planning how your money is going to be spent. Okay? If you budget, guaranteed you have probably um, not stayed on budget at some point. Why? Don't look at it as punishment, you fail. Look at it as, can I figure out why my plan is working? Can I adapt to it? in the future. All right, so let me, uh, I think that's the last of the slides there. That all. And um, asked you all again, does anyone have any examples of uh, anytime they plan for something and then your plans go through. Traffic 
controllers or whatever they had decided to eliminate from the top end. So sometimes it's not you causing the pain in the call to fail, but um, there are some things that you can come up with as alternatives. Perhaps you could have bought travel insurance. I'm not big on that, but uh, I know they are very popular taking cruises. They'll buy travel insurance because um, hurricanes will come and mess up their trips and that kind of stuff. Right? So think about what you can do to work around any potential failures. Like anybody else plan for anything? I asked about the weddings earlier. Anybody plan an outdoor wedding? That would scare me. Plan for an outdoor wedding? You better have some backup plans for that, all right? So I plan to graduate by a certain date. Okay. Has that plan been successful or have you had to adjust along the way? Okay. Uh, I mean, there's lots of things that we do in our personal life. Like how plan to go to the grocery store on Saturday. That's simple. Okay. Guess what? I got up Saturday morning and I had a flat car. All right. I mean, plans can be annoyances or they can be total devastation. Yeah, for me, that would be total devastation because I have cats. And if I don't get those cats that food, they're going to uh, attack me. And uh, that's going to be good. I, I don't shop myself, I shop my mom. My poor lady. Children, so, you know, but somebody else might say, oh, I got a flat car. Well, I'll get my friend to come over. We'll fix the car. I'll get it. Okay. Um, you know, what do you want to do about my alternatives of having those disasters or at least plan on how you're going to work around it? Okay. Um, I will admit that I'm one of those people that um, when something doesn't go right, I try to be getting kind of okay. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, really? Anybody else be able to get the budget issue? It's every time. Yeah, man. Oh, it tries to come back over now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else be getting something when the person that goes in the pit? Depends on what it is. Depends on what it is. Okay. All right. If you have a child who gets um, in an accident, that would put me in pain. Okay. But if I didn't have, if I became cold and I was pour a glass of milk and I was out of milk, I probably wouldn't be. Okay. Um, whatever night was so cold this week. Okay. Go in panic mode for a few moments there until I can get the people from the service authority to come turn my water out because I don't have a valve. I have to go to come down to the actual water meter thing and turn everything off. Um, and I tend to panic a little bit over stuff like that. Okay. And that's something I'm working on. Okay. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I think this is the fourth time I've had that happen. I've had bikes first. Um, I'm sort of learning. This is what I need to do. I need to call the service authority, have the work taken, cut off. Then I need to find a plumber to come fix things. Okay? And probably in the meantime, I need to call my daughter and say, can I go take a shower to her house? Because somebody have one. I don't panic quite as much as I did, but. Um, been a process. You don't want to get in an organization that's broke and panic when their plans fall through. Okay? You want to have your alternatives. Anybody, nobody else has come up with any 
Failing to plan is planning to fail. That's an old expression which still rings true today. I'll talk about the importance. importance of planning for business success and succession planning in this video. Hello, I'm Stephen Wilberg, bringing you practical tips and ideas on leadership, teamwork, and personal development in the workplace. It's a beautiful fall day. I decided to come out here and record this video rather than sitting in an office. Being able to do these types of things requires a certain freedom and it's something I kind of planned for instinctively. I knew what I wanted. I didn't want to be chained to a nine to five job, to a routine. I wanted to be able to grow, continue to grow and develop and be free to do some of the things I love to do, like making videos, like communicating, like teaching. And so this reality came out of a vision that I had. And I did write this down from time to time and what I wrote down was the kind of a life that I wanted to have, the kind of a feeling that went along with this. And this is a form of planning. You know, we, we look at planning often as a very rigid process, but it doesn't have to be that way. We have three intelligences that we can use in our business planning or our personal planning, and that's our logic, our head intelligence, our heart, our emotional intelligence, and our physical and instinctive intelligence. And when we plan, we want to consider all three because those capacities we use every day, the more and the better we can become at using our capacities and encouraging others and helping others to do that, the more we're going to contribute to our success. So personal development from that perspective is a really important part of planning. And having a vision for the future is as well. Because if we don't do that, then we just respond to whatever's going on in the environment. If we don't encourage our people to improve and develop themselves, then they become stuck in their routines and they become like these mindless machines that just do their job to get through the day and collect their paycheck at the end of the week to pay their bills. But life is much more than that. Life isn't about survival. Life is about growing and realizing our full potential. That's the gift that we've been given. And that translates in our personal life and in the workplace as well, because that's the workplace is where we spend most of our time. And so if we're given an opportunity to grow and realize our potential, and that's where we can use all our capacities, the skills that we've learned, our head, our heart, and our physiology, our instincts to get things done in the, in the best way we can. So if we use people's capacities, then we can create an organization where people are creative, where they're innovative, where they're happy to come to work. But it takes the leader's vision to create an organization like that and to then do the right things to make that become a reality. 
And that means becoming introspective, looking, learning about oneself, understanding oneself, understanding others that work with you, and knowing how to leverage the strengths of everybody to achieve that vision. But if you don't stop and reflect on that vision, then you just stay in that survival mode. And that's not very interesting for anybody. You know, one of my friends, uh, dad is in his 90s, and he has a very hard time letting go in, a, in such a way that now his capacities have depleted. He still goes to work every day, but he shouldn't be because part of the problem perhaps is he hasn't developed any other interests. So his whole identity is tied into the business. And this is a big problem because now he's no longer able to function as well as he could years ago and he's not making the right decision. And he hasn't planned or helped anybody be in the position where they can take over. He's never learned to delegate or never wanted to learn because perhaps of a fear of letting go. And this is one of the biggest problems for entrepreneurs is that if they don't grow, if they don't learn to let go of control and start to change their perspective of themselves, then the business stays stuck. So it's important that if you want to realize any vision and move and move towards a plan that you have, you need to also consider what do you need as a leader? What do you need to develop in yourself? What do you need to learn to develop other people? Because as the business grows, your role and your perspective must change. You must go from a doer to become a delegator, to become a coach, to become a mentor. This is how you're going to realize the full potential of your organization. And I just read an article, too, in the local business magazine that said that most entrepreneurs that are getting to the retirement age or beyond aren't thinking of retiring. And perhaps it's the same problem, fear of letting go. Their identity is so tied into their business. But it does pose a problem because... The only time they think of a succession plan is when they fall ill and then they don't have a choice. And at that point, maybe it's not the best time to make decisions. They haven't prepared themselves. Uh, they don't have anybody in the ranks waiting or able to take over. The good news is the article also said that there's many buyers on the market right now looking for businesses. But again, the entrepreneurs, uh, the elderly entrepreneurs aren't ready to sell. So that's an interesting thing that we'll see unfolding in the next few years, how that's going to unfold, actually. So create that future for yourself. Visualize it. Start planning for it. Start growing towards it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a comment, and we'll talk again soon. I hope you find these tips useful. Here's some videos that are related that you can watch right now. Subscribe to our channel to get news of new videos as they come out. Thanks for listening and talk again soon.
that certainly doesn't just say we want to offer classes. Okay, um, they're actually defining who their customers are and what they're trying to do for their customers. All right, let's talk quickly about the um, test for next week. Look at your syllabus. Um, we'll notice that we have the whole week next week designated for the test, which is all the first five chapters. Um, because I have to go back and forth between campuses, um, and the test is designed to be taken on the computer. What I'm going to do is use Tuesday to test my folks in Keys Hall, and I'll use Thursday to test the folks here in South Boston. Okay? Um, so I do have to proctor what you're doing to make sure the right people are doing. The Emporia and um, Christiana folks, I will um, send you an email. Hopefully, we can work something out with someone in the uh, CLC or someone who's on here that is for you, but it will be on the computer. Okay, you will be able to use your textbooks and your PowerPoints. Okay, any notes that you have will be fine. But once you start the test, you have to finish it. Okay, um, you can't print it off or anything like that. You can't go outside of the test like to other websites or trying to get back to the PowerPoints or anything. So you need to have credit whatever you want to use. So Tuesday, the peaceful people will take the test. I will be there at our normal, our normal time to do it and we'll find some available computers to do. Okay? Tuesday, this campus, South Boston, does not have to come. Okay? Thursday, the Keysville campus does not have to come to class, but the South Boston campus will come and will take the test in this classroom on these computers. Okay? I'll try to send out a reminder. Uh, through Blackboard or email or something to let you know. In Korea and Christiana, I will contact the CLC or the company at those locations and make sure they are available to test for you. So I'll probably be asking you to take it during the normal class time since you are uh, typically scheduled to be here during that time. So uh, I, I really have no uh, particular desire for you to take it either Tuesday or Thursday. You can choose one of those two days, but I will just have to get you to let me know so I can arrange okay. So I'll shoot an email and ask for a response from Victoria and um, Chris Ann. Okay? And so what days have you asked? Otherwise, um, useful campus. Tuesday, you'll test South Boston campus. Thursday, not testing on those days. Do not have to come to class. Like, don't forget, there's also a homework due this Sunday. So, take a look at that, and I think that is probably all for today. Everybody's okay.